so as introduced, I'll be talking about decentralized off-chain backends. And um, in particular, I'll first introduce sort of what Autonomous is um, and how it gives rise to these kind of uh, technologies. Then I'll cover how we use uh, Autonomous today um, before I'll explain in detail um, how we basically uh, use IPFS across pretty much all layers of our stack. And finally, uh, I'll drive home how you and if you're a member of a DAO can benefit uh, and give a bit of a sneak peek um, ahead. So just one short slide on myself. Uh, I'm one of the kind of original contributors to Autonomous, uh, which itself is a DAO, um, an open source stack at the same time. Uh, I co-founded uh, an AI and crypto labs called Valerie. Uh, and prior to that, um, I worked at the same intersection of AI and crypto. And prior to that, uh, did a PhD in economics. So let's have a first look at what Autonomous is. In particular, what the software stack is, uh, its protocol and its purpose, and how it can uh, basically be seen as a foundational network for a term we call co-owned AI. And in the context, I'll also explain what I mean by that. So first, I'd like to kind of uh, explain uh, in a bit more detail this, this idea of the decentralized off-chain backend. And in the context of Autonomous, we give it a specific name. Uh, it's called an autonomous service. And what you can do uh, with this autonomous, autonomous service stack is built basically any kind of off-chain application that takes arbitrary amounts of data from arbitrary sources, be it Web2 APIs, um, Web2-like wrappers of Web3 data, or actual uh, nodes participating in any sort of uh, web-free network. That data then gets consumed by the service, which uh, can run continuously because it's running off chain and can do um, arbitrarily complex things. Um, and ultimately it can then uh, take actions on chain uh, as well as of course off chain. So if it does take action on chain, um, it can do so at the moment on any EVM compat compatible chain, as well as um, to some degree also Cosmos and Solana chains. But the way it's architected is that it's totally um, kind of a blockchain agnostic. As long as there's a smart contracting layer, it should in principle be possible to deploy it on, on such um, a chain or targeting such a chain. Now, why do we call it uh, decentralized? Because Ultimately, the software stack um, allows you to run whatever application you're implementing here as a decentralized node system off-chain. So the way to think about it a bit is like a ephemeral blockchain for uh, lack of a better word. Now, having introduced this concept, I'm going to um, basically change gear and focus on the uh, protocol first. So the autonomous protocol is what lives on the blockchain and it ultimately facilitates three things. It provides a set of on-chain registries to um, represent different components of these applications. It allows for the tokenomics mechanism, the incentive mechanism, and it allows for governance. And so specifically um, today, it's worth pointing out sort of two aspects of the protocol. Uh, one is kind of depicted here on the left, which is how these autonomous services, which live off chain, are secured on chain. So they're represented on chain as NFTs. And the service itself takes action via its service specific multisig. So ultimately, the threat model looks very much like you would. Be something you would be known from a, um, a proof of stake system with a, a two third plus one honest majority. Um, 
this system then can take action uh, against any other on-chain contract, um, you know, be it a DeFi protocol, uh, a governance uh, contract, uh, you name it. So this is how we secure these services. And then um, in terms of the developer experience um, of developers building um, services on this protocol, they don't necessarily have to build the whole service. They can build subcomponents of it. So let's say a developer develops such a component, they can then register this in the protocol. And that of course, adds additional functionality to these kind of off-chain services which can be built. And if someone, uh, in particular a DAO, uses these functionalities in their own autonomous service and wants to reward the developers who have originally contributed to the service, then they can do so uh, natively in the autonomous protocol. So the autonomous protocol ultimately has this incentive uh, mechanism for developers to bring these components which make up autonomous services and reward them for that. Now, ultimately, sort of before I kind of wrap on this autonomous piece and, and get into how we use IPFS and the applications, I just want to kind of give you a sort of sense of the North Star, um, which drives us or which we work towards. It's this idea of having co-owned AI programs, i.e. AI programs or, or systems that are both co-owned, where multiple parties own the system, as well as um, jointly operated, so that there isn't a single um, party um, controlling any aspect of, of the system. And we, we, we refer to this as co-owned AI. Um, and but ultimately, we see sort of autonomous as one of multiple ways in which you could build such a uh, co-owned AI system. Now, uh, just to go from the theory into the practice, I want to give a couple of examples of how the stack is used today. Um, we have the same software architecture driving quite different applications across different uh, verticals in crypto. And so on the left, um, we have built with Balancer under a grant a product which is called Balancer Smart Managed Pools. It is effectively an autonomous asset management product where this off-chain system, the autonomous service, ingests data, does uh, some minimal uh, compute and decision-making on it and continuously then reweight a pool, um, which is uh, on-chain, a pool of assets. And so what this allows us to basically create um, an index product based off off-chain data. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we've uh, got an automation product, an autonomous keeper service, which is deployed in the keeper network um, protocol uh, on Ethereum, where it effectively just works jobs. So anyone who has an automation need can register it there and the, and, and the keeper system will pick it up. Why is it interesting? Because basically it creates a sort of um, configurable fault tolerance as to the job execution likelihood. A lot, um, before we brought the autonomous keeper service to the keeper network, um, basically you had to uh, hope that your job incentivized actors in the network to work your job. With the autonomous keeper service, you can sort of configure that because you can define how many keeper bots or agents you have in this network, which are continuously available and working jobs. Um, we have a couple of more uh, examples here, but I'll, I'll leave them for you to look up if you're curious um, in the interest of time. Um, one particular spotlight I would put on, I would like to put on the governator though. And um, that's both a lighthearted experiment as well as one with very serious implications. Um, so effectively what we've done is we've created an off-chain system to which you can delegate your governance tokens and you can endow the system with one of two very extreme voting preferences. That's the lighthearted part, good or evil. And the system will then take those into account to effectively vote on upcoming proposals fully autonomously. 
Uh, if you're curious about this, like our Twitter feed um, contains more information on this and I'm happy to share afterwards. Now, we're obviously at an IPFS conference and uh, I really want to kind of introduce how we're uh, using IPFS across all layers of the autonomous stack. And that's where I want to spend the rest of the time on. So there's four key areas where we do that. One is to reference and retrieve code components. The second application is uh, to provide a production grade package registry. The third application is that the way we reference code components also contributes to the crypto economic integrity of the system. And then the fourth part is that we use um, effectively the peer to peer for peer discovery in the network, which is established by these agents so that they can find and communicate with each other. So I'll introduce those in turn. Starting with the packages in the autonomous stack, um, as mentioned before, they're referenced using CIDs. So specifically what happens is um, a developer creates and publishes a software package, um, which is specific to our framework. It's a, a Python framework at the moment, although for um, the protocol that's irrelevant. Um, so the developer would create this package, publish it in the remote registry, and in this uh, framework, we reference all code files, all packages via CIDs. And so this gives us this nice uh, dependency tree where we can say, OK, a given code package um, is content addressed by this hash. Uh, we can take this up to the level of the agent as well as to the level of the service. And so that then allows us to represent these uh, elements uh, on chain, to which we'll come in a second in more detail uh, via NFTs. This, the, the important thing here to keep in mind is that this mapping is between the on-chain part and the off-chain code is entirely optimistic, of course. So there's no way for us to verify um, cryptographically on-chain at the moment that these packages are in fact what the registrant purports them to be. Uh, instead, the uh, protocol incentives, um, the economic aspects of the protocol try to align the incentives for the developers to uh, represent them correctly. So coming to the second part, because we have this uh, on-chain representations as NFTs of off-chain packages, um, we can do a, a number of uh, interesting things. So firstly, we can use this um, as a system to track contributions to a given autonomous service. Um, so if let's say a developer uh, contributed various of those components into an agent or even the agent and the service is made up of those, um, then if there's any uh, rewards effectively associated with the service NFT, then they can be allocated to the contributing parts, which make it up. There's another very practical uh, element of uh, using uh, this mechanism to uh, reference packages, which is that we can basically point the CLI tool to the on-chain NFT and from that spin up the entire service, including all its configuration, et cetera. Um, which means that in an autonomous service where let's say we have four different operators, one running an agent instance each, when they want to launch their agent, all they have to do is point the CLI to the NFT ID of this service in which they're operating in. And then the CLI tool will be able to fetch the metadata from the metadata, fetch the code, build the source code, um, and then run it. Um, this also helps us to a degree to prevent um, sort of default uh, uh, malicious behavior in the sense by default, the application is compatible and malicious actors basically have to A, uh, fork um, the stack and uh, uh, bypass the 
um, use of the hashing to ensure for the integrity as well as are then subjected to, to a slashing protocol, which, which comes on top to, to address the outstanding um, uh, issues which can't be addressed uh, any other way. Um, so this was the second part where we use IPFS. The third part is in order to store all this code um, remotely off chain, um, we have implemented our own uh, effectively IPFS enabled registry where developers can pin autonomous packages. Um, very practically, the way this is implemented is as a cluster uh, currently with three nodes, although it's, it's scalable uh, based on demand, uh, where each uh, node represents a pod containing both an IPFS node and an IPFS cluster node, um, which allows us then by the IPFS cluster functionality to synchronize the IPFS data between the underlying IPFS nodes. And so what we have as a result is this very resilient uh, and fault tol tolerant um, IPFS infrastructure for fetching these um, packages and storing them. In fact, we have uh, also built a content verification uh, layer on top, uh, which basically checks whether the provided uh, code is of the framework sorts and otherwise rejects these uploads. Um, what are some key learnings here? Um, they're from one of our uh, developers who worked on it, um, and he's in our Discord. If you want to reach out, he was very excited working on this product and made a lot of optimizations around the cluster configurations, which overall really um, uh, helped us reduce our networking ingress and egress um, costs, uh, which were initially quite high with the default configuration. So if this is something you're curious about, uh, please reach out. And then the final and fourth part where we use parts of the IPFS stack is in the agent communication network. So first, what does the agent communication network do? It effectively allows point-to-point -point communication between um, agents uh, where these agents initially, the only thing they have is their wallet addresses. So agents all have a wallet. Um, so they have an account on let's say Ethereum. Um, and then there's another one uh, they know that they want to talk to each other, but that's all they've got. So they have no idea where in the network, um, the public internet, the other agent is located. And the role of the ACN is to establish that mapping. And so we've built this kind of custom uh, application there, which under the hood uses the uh, lib peer to peer library um, and effectively establishes a distributed hash table to allow for this um, uh, mapping between wallet addresses and uh, agents location in the uh, internet. So that wraps the section on how we use IPFS. Um, uh, we are, as you can see, using it quite widely across our stack and uh, are big uh, fans of the ecosystem. Please do reach out if you have any recommendations or questions. And just to round off, um, I want to re-emphasize um, that DAOs can benefit and, and entities wanting to build DAOs can benefit from our stack today. Um, our stack allows you to decentralize and make actually autonomous your off-chain processes. A lot of DAOs have quite um, centrally operated um, fault intolerant uh, processes uh, off-chain. So that might be the stack for you. It is a fully open source stack, so you can fork it or contribute to it. And it allows for high composability and code reuse. So all the application which we saw before um, share a tremendous amount of the same even application logic, uh, which is one of the big benefits of the stack. Um, these days, uh, we are mostly uh, working on slashing, um, which is coming um, live uh, still this quarter. And we're exploring how DAOs can use their own governance tokens to effectively secure such autonomous services um, to operate their own off-chain infrastructure. And that wraps my presentation. If you've got any questions, um, let me know. 
So could you please tell me, you mentioned DAOs operators as users of Autonolos. Uh, do you focus on any other users? Yeah, so it's a good question. We have basically an autonomous service has sort of um, different user group it, it, it touches. So there's the entity, which could be like a, a single person or a DAO, a smart contract who owns the service. Um, so they effectively have like the rights to turn it on and off again, effectively and configure it. There's the operators, are you the, the entities who are running the different nodes in the service? And then there is the beneficiaries of the service. Um, all, all three could be the same or could be different entities. So in a DAO, um, for instance, in, in Autonomous DAO, we have some of those services which, which serve the DAO itself. Um, uh, the beneficiaries might be uh, community members in this case, and the operators are DAO members, and the actual service owner is the DAO governance contract itself. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Um, just a question about the workings. Is it like that you um, deploy a service or a running autonomously running script on the peer-to-peer -peer network, which listens to a blockchain and then does an action? Or is like the triggering coming from the contract on the blockchain and that calls like the... Yeah, it's a great question. Um, thank you. Uh, let me go back to one of the slides just for ease of reference. So the autonomous service is its own node system and it is running off chain. So in the, in the default sense of, of, of the uh, ecosystem, if you come to it today, you would uh, run your own autonomous service. And so then you would decide how many operators there are. Um, probably initially you would want to be like the single operator and the single owner. Um, and so, then specifically, where are the events created in a sense? So you have two parts here. So one, the service is continuously running. So it's not, it's not um, a smart contract on a chain which only uh, waits for transaction and then gets executed. It is a continuously running process uh, of chain. In fact, a number of them coordinated. Um, and so there's sort of two ways it, it could make progress, so to speak. One is it could listen for events either on some Web2 API or on, on a Web3 um, node, like, a, like an on-chain event. And then that could trigger something in the logic of the service, which maybe leads to a new transaction or something internal. And the other thing, and that's, that's the key thing, is you could have proactive behavior of the service itself. So that's where really the autonomy comes from. Um, by proactively, basically, maybe on, on, on time or on internal states of, of, of a model uh, it has of the world, that it, it can take action. And that's very different, obviously, from a smart contract on-chain because it can simply not do that. It needs to wait for a transaction. Does, does that answer your question? So, and when you say off-chain, that could be my laptop or it could be uh, multiple peers on your uh, on the network. Yes, yeah, so great question. So the deployment mode is up to the service owner. So you can run often the same application, like just locally as one in one agent instance on your laptop, let's say, or on like a cloud server you provision. Um, and then once you want this kind of benefit of the fault tolerance uh, of of maybe decentralization by adding more operators, you would scale up the number of, of nodes um, and then they can run in different configuration as long as they have access to the public internet and the static IP allocation and so on. Does, does that uh, satisfy uh, your question or does this answer your question? Yes, okay. Thank you, David, it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me and uh, I hope you have a nice uh, rest of the uh, conference. <laughs>